is at. It's not in man's intellect. It's not in my ability to communicate. It's in what I'm communicating. Am I preaching Christ? Is anyone up here who comes to this pulpit, whether it's a scripture reading, whether it's for the Lord's Supper, whether it's for a sermon, if it's not built around Christ, we're going to lose the point of this all. It must be about Christ. It's all of Christ for all of life. It's Christ or chaos. That's why we say these things, because it's all about Christ. It must be about him. We cannot look to things that have no power and expect those things to give us something it cannot produce. So look at what's going on here in verse 2. Let me ask you only this. This is rhetoric, by the way. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Similar to what he said to Peter, right? And the works of the law, remember, the law is not bad. The works of the law that Paul is harping on here is, is those works like circumcision, like uh, returning to Jewish customs in order to gain something in the salvation. That's what Paul is despising here. Paul's not despising the law of God. The law of God is good, but he's despising the law of God if it becomes something to be added to your salvation as a means to truly be saved. And so what Paul is getting at is, if you didn't begin by the flesh, why are you now putting confidence in the flesh? Having begun by the Spirit, why are you now trying to walk by the flesh? Why are you now turning to marks of the flesh to be evidence for you when the Spirit has already given you Christ? You already have Him. You've been sealed by Him. And so, listen, church, the same way that we started in Christ by faith is the same way that we live in Christ by faith. The just shall live by faith. It's not the just begin their just life by faith. No, they live by faith. They live by faith in the Son of God. The same gospel that brought us in is the gospel that keeps us. That gospel of justification by faith is what fuels everything. And so these Galatians are going from the greater, which is the Spirit's work in them, which is the, the gospel's producing in them, which is Christ, and they're returning to the flesh. The, I mean, they're going backwards here. And Paul, again, is a very, very effective preacher. He knows what he's doing. From the, oh, you foolish Galatians, from the, 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 that voice, that emphasis, that love. And now he goes on as an effective preacher to show something that I think we need to regain, especially in Reformed churches. Now, I know that in Charismania, that there is wild stuff that happens, and that's the powerful stuff for them, Right? They repeat things, repeat things, repeat things, hoping to summon some type of thing to come down. And there's all this draw on the emotions. There's all this pulling on the emotions. And it's all about that, the experience of the emotions and the display that's going on. Now, I'm not advocating for that. But because of a sinful response, probably better word, a sinful reaction to that, the reform camp goes all the way over here, and they think that this is effective preaching. We're here to worship Christ thankful for Christ and there's no there's nothing in it there's no vibrancy in that and then they think that we sing amazing songs like great is thy faithfulness great is thy faith no great is thy faithfulness and so look at Paul's doing here the, uh, the 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 true wisdom of Paul he's telling them think about when you got saved he's he's drawing their emotion back to when they first learned Christ Remember that first day. Remember your first love. Remember those early days. Go back in your heart, in your mind's eye, and remember how you began. Paul is truly pulling on their affections in a very biblical way. We're not scared of emotions here. Those emotions just need to come under the lordship of Christ. But we want, I truly want your affections to truly be stirred up as much as we can for the glory of God. It is a beautiful thing to see people zealous for the glory of God. So we're not here to be some emotionless stoics that think that we have it all figured out because we're, you know, we're stone-faced and, and, and we have a furrowed brow on us and we really take things serious here. That's not Christianity. That's not Christ. That's not Paul. That's not David. That's not the scriptures. What I see in the scriptures is great joy. Even in the midst of sorrow, there's great joy. I mean, Christ literally rebukes the disciples and says, why are you walking around sorrowful when the bridegroom is here? It's a wedding party. 
And so, church, what I want us to see is Paul is getting his uh, listeners, his hearers here, to truly think about the sufficiency of Christ. Remember how you began. Remember those early days. And I think we've all been there. We know Christians. They get fired. Uh, um, so they, they, they truly get saved, and they're fired up for the things of the Lord. They're all in. They're asking questions. They're studying. They're praying. They're, they're at everything. They're trying to preach to everyone. And you say, relax a little, relax a little. You know, enjoy this. And we say, relax. But then they relax too much, and five years go by, and it's like they're not even caring for the things of the Lord. Ten years go by, and you don't even hear them talk about Christ anymore. Paul's telling those type of people, remember how you began. Remember those early days when your heart was just burning within you for Christ. Remember that when you heard about the forgiveness of sins and the joy that that brought your life and how you wanted to tell everyone about that. How many Christian churches, how many Christians have you met that have gone astray because they began to grow cold for Christ? Because Christ was now boring to them. In the name of good things, right? I know so many Christians get so wrapped up in Israel and the rapture that that's all that consumes them. No Christ. Christians that get so consumed in anything under the sun when it's not at all related to Christ. They don't bring Christ to bear there. How many Christians have you met because of church hurt or, or false expectations of the church that they turned their back on Christ? Christ didn't hurt you. We're all going to fail you. Christ will never fail you. Again, this is all because they forgot Christ. So Paul, being an effective preacher, is saying, remember Christ. Remember how you first began. Remember those early days. Even when your theology was not as good as it is today, remember how joyful you were then. Remember how zealous you were then. Don't lose that childlike faith. Don't lose that childlike joy, that excitement for the things of the Lord. Because Paul really, in this entire section, <clears throat> that's all he's trying to do. All he's trying to do is get Christians to remember Christ, to think about Christ. Look at verse 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? That same reality. Are you so foolish to think that if you began by something that had nothing to do with you, this is sovereign grace here. The Spirit worked in you. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. So it's the Spirit, all of grace in your life. That's why Spurgeon wrote a whole book. It's all of grace. Anything good in you is all of grace. When you began to believe, it was by the Spirit. When you, when you slay sin, it's by the Spirit. When you have a good week, it's by the Spirit. And Paul is saying, if the good in you is by the Spirit, why are you turning to the flesh? That's the bad in you. Why are you returning to the, the dead works that you think you can produce by your Spirit? No, we must not ever depend upon the flesh for only that which the Spirit can produce in us. Do we want people to mature? Do we want them to, to grow in theology? Do, 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 are we like really zealous about them learning a, a more experiential truth about the Bible and who our Christ is? Of course we want that. But we don't even do that by the flesh. All of that must be done by the Spirit. Everything. We cannot mix our justification with our sanctification. We cannot. If we think that our sanctification is the basis for our justification, we're going to be lost every single time. No, the sufficiency of Christ is just as we began in Christ. All the way through our Christian life, it's all going to be undergirded by Christ and by His Spirit. So sometimes we think that, well, you know, God saved us when we were already moving toward Him. God saved us as we were already doing good things for Him, for, for him as, as we were already, you know, we want to come to church and we want to do these good things, and that's when God saved me. I'm telling you, God saved you when you were absolutely dead in your sins. And so if that's when God saved you, why do you think that in the middle of that, you're able to add something by your flesh? We can't add anything to our salvation. It's all coming from God and God's grace alone to us. It's all top down to us. It's all blessings flowing to us, church. We were dead in our sins. We were dead in our trespasses. And that's when we were rescued. So let me just pivot real quick. If you're dead in your sins this morning, you are in the best place to be for God to save you. If you are an enemy of God this morning, you are exactly where you need to be for God to save you. 
I don't want you to come and pretend that you're not an enemy of God. I don't want you to come and, and, and to pretend that you're not dead in your sins. No, I want you to come and say, I'm dead in my sins. I'm currently an enemy of God. And I'll say, that's where God finds you. That's where God saves us. That's where he saved all of us. When we saw that we were dead in our sins. When, when, when we see that we are helpless apart from Christ, that's when God gives us faith. So if you're outside of Christ this morning, that's where he finds people outside of Christ to bring them in Christ. By faith and repentance and seeing that I deserve punishment for my sin. I look to Christ who, who, who died for sinners and I believe in him. I trust in him and I repent of my sin. That's, that's what God does in us. So if you're an enemy, if you're dead in sin this morning, don't shy away. Don't hide it. That's where you need to be. Because if you're in the self-righteousness, you'll never come. You think you're fine. You think you're good in that spot. No, I don't want you to be self-righteous. I want you to see I'm dead. And owning that will now put you in the spot where you need to be to be saved by God. So back to what Paul is getting at. All he's driving at here is you cannot, you must not begin to live your life that began by the Spirit. You cannot live that life now by the flesh. Self-dependence, self-reliance. You cannot and you must not. When you do, when you begin to, to trust in yourself for anything, your wisdom for anything, what you think is best for anything, that's when you slowly begin to drift away from Christ. And again, as I said, this whole section is just playing on the same reality. Let's read verses 4 through 6. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So again, he's just playing on these same questions, on these same realities. It's this reality of do not put confidence in the flesh, not for anything, not for the way you grow, not for the way you parent, not for the way that you evangelize, the way that you have community, whatever it is, you cannot put your confidence in the flesh. Our eyes must always be fixed upon Christ, and it must be by the Spirit's work in us. And there's such a, a vital point here that Paul makes in verse 4. He, he's essentially arguing all those things that you suffered as Galatians, are you really going to throw that away? All that suffering, is it going to be in vain? This is, again, Paul's just so wise in his dealings, in his rhetoric, and the way that he pulls on the heartstrings, as it were. Paul is essentially saying, God has worked such rich miracles in your sight, and you're going to throw that all away. You know, we read the Old Testament, and we read about uh, God saving the Israelites out of Egypt, and, and, and we read about all the miracles he did before them, all those plagues that he performed there, and, and the parting of the Red Sea, and then they get into the wilderness, and they're worshiping a golden calf. And we think, those, right, I'm telling you, we're like that. We are absolutely like that having seen so many blessings that God has given us, and we still complain, and we still make silly comments, and we still go and turn to the flesh. God has given us healthy marriages. God has given us joyful children. God has given us the ability to, to homeschool our children, even in California. God has given us, uh, given us a vibrant faith, a, a, a church, a vibrant church, a community, and somehow in all of that blessing and all of that work of the Spirit, we can find the one thing that'll set us up a wall and make that the focal point of our life. And we'll throw away so much for the one thing when there's hundreds of blessings right there for us when there's so much work of God right before our face, even the blessing of a tongue, a blessing of being able to speak, the blessing of being able to hear, we're turning those blessings as ministers for sin. We'll even use these blessings to say sinful things. Paul is just driving home this, this reality, this foolish reality that these Galatians who've seen God work in their midst, who've been given blessing upon blessing upon blessing, and they're going to throw it all, in, all away, in vain, all of it. Because they were bewitched. Because their eyes were taken off Christ. Because they 
weren't content with the sufficiency of Christ. And that's really all that our Christian life comes down to, church. You notice in your Christian life where your eyes are not fixed on Christ, tell me there isn't despair there. Tell me there isn't worry and anxiety and depression in those areas, those areas that you're just holding on to because you really do not want to look to Christ in those areas. It's true of everything. So as we close up the sermon, I just want us to truly realize that the gospel that saved us is the gospel that continues to be the source by which we live. Colossians 2.6 uh, 2, says, As you learned Christ, so walk in Him. How did you learn Christ? Faith in the gospel. So how do you walk in Him? Faith in the gospel. What He's done for me here, the greatest thing He's done for me is save me, so I walk in light of that. We walk by faith. We start by faith, we live by faith, and we finish by faith. All of it is by faith. And you must receive all of that by faith. And you, be, you grow in your faith by beholding your Christ. Now let me just give a word of caution to us as a local church. I love biblical manhood. I love biblical womanhood. I love politics. I love education. I love theology. I love politics and conspiracy theories. I love sports. I love working out. I love health. I love good food. I love good aspects of learning about diet and all that's out there. There's a world for us to love and to enjoy. There is so much good to enjoy. But I'm telling you, if any of those things are done without Christ being the central aim and His glory, it will all end up in dead orthodoxy. It will all end up in dead idols, empty idols. It, you know, a lot of us really love to live out biblical manhood as men. I'm telling you, men, if you do that without Christ being the joy of it all, you're going to become a jerk because you're going to forget Christ in all, in all of it. And, and, and same thing with women, right? A lot of us love biblical womanhood. If you do that, then your dresses and the way you keep your home and all that, that'll be your Christ. Am I doing these things enough? I, am, I, am, I, am I wearing the right stuff enough? So what I'm saying is those things are good. Think about those things, right? Politics, homeschooling, education, all of that. Those are all wonderful things that we as a Christian church must speak to. Christ speaks to it. We must speak to it. But what I'm saying is those things cannot be the, the telos, the ultimate end. All of that has to rise back up to Christ. Now you say, okay, well, that's easy. There's easy. Let me go a step further and show you just how quickly this can happen. Let's go with fellowship. We all love fellowship. We love fellowship here. We want to spend time together. We enjoy each other. We love fellowship. If there's ever a moment where we begin to lose sight of Christ in fellowship, it'll become, well, why was I invited to that? Or why are those guys so happy? Oh, I wonder what they're doing today. And it'll become clicks, and it'll become the who's who and who's doing what. And, and, you know, you see someone else post something and you'll think, oh, man, how come they didn't talk to me? Are they upset uh, with me? Is, is there something going on now? And you're losing sight of Christ. You're losing sight of Christ. And you're making all about who? All about you. All about what you can gain. All about how, these, rather than saying, praise God that those brothers are hanging out. Praise God that those sisters are getting together. You've made it all about self. And that's the exact way that in fellowship, if we lose sight of Christ, we'll turn a good thing like fellowship into something that's detrimental in the local church. Oh, what about something like Bible study? Bible studies are amazing. We need to do Bible studies. I can't wait for more Bible studies to pop up in our local church and people get together throughout the week and have Bible studies. And we've all heard of those churches. Oh, you go to that Bible study? Oh, how, what's that Bible study like? And it all becomes about what all these little cliques and all these little Bible studies. We're so foolish. The Christian church is so... I've seen churches break up because of who went to what Bible study. I mean, I, I don't get it. And it's the same thing that's happening here. 
It's the same thing that's happened with the Galatians. And I'll be honest, there have been times in the season of our local church where I've thought, are we forgetting Christ? All this good, all this blessing, are we forgetting Christ? Are we going to throw it all away for petty things? Church, I'm being dead serious. We will lose the blessing and the joy of this church if we make things about us. If we make it all built around us and how people could serve us. Get your eyes fixed upon Christ and all things will get settled in the right place. And if we do not do that, we will look back five years from now. We'll look back and say, we had it good and we complained about nothing. We argued about nothing because we forgot Christ. Church, a subtle looking away from Christ can cause catastrophic realities in your life and in the life of the local church. So my caution to you is, whatever it is, from your private life to your public life, from your home life to the church life, from you on Mondays to you on Sundays, whatever it is, I'm telling you, filter everything you do through the glory of Christ, and you'll be okay. You'll find the joy of it. You'll find the meaning of it. And then it'll all become worship to you. So are we truly holding every thought captive to Christ? Let me give a closing word here to parents. Sometimes parents are shocked when their kids go astray, when their kids are bewitched by the world. And those kids were spoon-fed everything except Christ. They were given the media of the world. They were giving, given uh, you know, endless time of, of secular uh, type of you know, enjoyment. And they spent 30 minutes in a Sunday school classroom. They weren't ever discipled. They were never instructed. They were never taught how to bring all things under the Lordship of Christ. So parents, make sure you are explicitly showing your children how to honor Christ in every sphere of life. Everything that you do. When, when dads, when you're going to work, show them this is for Christ. This is not just for the paycheck. This is for Christ. When you come home tired and you play with your children and say, this is for Christ. It's not just because I love you guys and I enjoy you guys and I miss you guys. That's part of it, but all that is ultimately for Christ. When you are learning things with them, when you're watching documentaries with them, when you're growing in education with your children, show them how 2 plus 2 equals 4. Show them how that's all because of Christ. And all that math should glorify Christ. And if you don't know how to do that, ask someone who's doing these things. If you don't know how you bring those, the, the, even math to bear uh, from the glory of God, then ask someone. When, when you're teaching your, 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 your child sociology or math or science, how, how do you rise it up to Christ? Ask someone. Because it needs to be that type of formative uh, training for our children to see this world belongs to Christ and everything therein, and we could truly do all things for Him. So just in closing, by way of review the first step you take in the christian faith church is because the spirit has given you faith and the step one to step 18 million i don't know however, however many steps you take all those steps in between i'm telling you depend upon the spirit to give you faith walk in faith and every step that you take have your eyes fixed upon christ whatever is between you as you're stepping no there's an ultimate purpose in this there's an ultimate end in this all your Mondays, there's Christ right behind all those Mondays. Uh, all those homeschooling ventures, there's Christ right behind uh, uh, all those homeschooling ventures. Every shift that you work, man, there's Christ right there behind it, ready to receive the glory and worship that you're giving him as you work. All of your life, live with Christ at the end of it, and everything in between will now begin to make sense. But you must do that. You must do that, not by the flesh. You must do that by the power of the Spirit. Christ is in everything. And everything that we do must have the aim and the glory all given to our God. And how do you do that? By faith. By faith. And how do you get faith? Look to Christ. And how do you do it again? By faith. And how do you get faith? Look to Christ. It's just a, a never-ending thing. But that's the joy of our life, because that's what eternity will be, beholding the glory of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you have given us new eyes to see Christ. We're thankful that once we were blind, but now we see. Lord, we ask that you would truly fix our gaze upon Christ, that we would behold him. And as we behold him, well, everything now is worship and joy in that. 
Lord, we have so many means of grace to help us to grow in this grace. We have the Lord's Supper that we're about to partake in. The Lord's Supper is a grace to bolster our faith and to see Christ even in the elements. We have fellowship. We have prayer. We have the Lord's Day. We have so many things, Lord. We need to see how blessed we are, lest we throw it all away because we looked elsewhere. Lord, help us even now in the Lord's Supper to look to Christ. In his mighty name we pray. Amen. On the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul was about to die. And he's writing young Timothy his last letter. In 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy to remember Christ. That's it. Two, two sentences. So two words, one sentence. Remember Christ. Remember Christ. Because Paul knows if Timothy is going to do this walk, live this life, venture on in the Christian life, it will only be as he remembers who Christ is. So even now, as you come to the Lord's table, I ask you to remember Christ and to remember what he's done for you even signified in these elements. Come and welcome to Jesus Christ.